Happy Monday, everyone. This is Martha with Nature Niche. I hope you had a nice Easter weekend. Uh, this week, I'm going to continue with my posts about uh, spring yard or garden cleanup um, and talk to you about saving your stems. This is a step in the Xerces Society's uh, conservation campaign uh, called Bring Back the Pollinators. Um, so traditional landscape practices have us often cutting back our dead stems and deadheading our fading flower blooms. Uh, but this robs our landscapes of important food and nesting resources for our wildlife. So last week I talked about um, leaving your leaves and kind of how late, how long did, and how best to do that. And this week I wanted to talk about um, saving your stems. And so why would you want to do that? Well, by letting um, your native plants go to seed and um, leaving the seed heads and the, the dead stems standing throughout the winter and early spring, you're providing important food resources to our uh, native seed eating birds. For more about that, check out Monday with Martha number 194. You're also um, helping to provide habitat for our native bees. Many of those are solitary nesters and they use um, hollow stems, cavities or tunnels that form naturally in the stems of uh, plants that are, some are naturally hollow, others are pithy and that um, soft center tends to decompose over time. Um, but also in branches and logs formed by um, wood boring insects, those tunnels. So uh, I'm talking about species like our small carpenter bees, yellow faced bees, large leaf cutter bees, um, large carpenter bees, among many others. Also, our beneficial insects uh, like cavity nests wasps. An example would be uh, the aphid honey, hunting wasp. Great thing to have in your yard. Um, stem boring moths, some spiders, they live in hollow stems and some um, insect species will place their eggs into these hollowed stems of wildflowers and grasses for them to overwinter safely. So we're providing good habitat by saving our stems. So how do you go about saving your, your stems to be most beneficial? Uh, you want to leave them standing dead uh, over the winter and you can start uh, cutting them back in early spring, uh, especially if you wanna create nest sites before the, the first early emerging bees start flying. So that could be late March through April, uh, depending on where you live in the country. You want to make your cuts at uh, varying heights to offer a diversity of stem nesting locations. Uh, cutting higher on the plant, you usually have a lower diameter in that stem. Um, cutting closer to the base of the plant, you'll have a larger opening for larger uh, body insect species to use. And you want to make those cuts. You can you know, just use clippers. Um, or break them off. You want to cut high and you want to be about um, 24 inches to, oop, and I got a node there, 24 inches um, down to about eight inches above the ground. So aim for kind of that range in height. And um, when you cut, you want to make sure the stem um, section you're leaving behind is uh, four to six inches from a node. So this is a uh, giant yellow hyssop. And so I tried to cut right beneath the node to leave um, several inches uh, for um, different tunnel nesting bees to be able to lay an egg and then section it off and then lay the next egg and section it off. Um, or if you're, you've got a branch, try to cut it out um, at least four to six inches from, from the main stem. And by doing that, you're offering enough length for that um, egg laying process. 
So this is a great resource that I'll provide a link for. This is a Xerces Society document, um, Nesting and Overwintering Habitat for Pollinators and Other Beneficial Insects. And I just wanted to show, because a lot of people um, aren't aware that our many of our native bees, tunnel nesting or stem nesting bees, lay an individual egg and um, or on like a bee bread, like pollen and nectar mixed together, and then they section it off. And so each little egg develops into a larvae along the length of the stem. So this is more of a um, symbolic representation of that process. But I just, I just wanted to show that, that um, our, many of our native bees don't have hives or honeycomb, but actually lay their eggs in this way. Um, and you want to leave the cut stems at the base of the plant if you can. Um, they'll decompose and become mulch, and then they're still there for the birds to forage off of and things like that. Or you can put them into a compost pile, or you can collect them and bundle them together and place them either vertically or horizontally in little natural habitat bundles to offer um, additional natural habitat for our tunnel nesting bees. You can um, prune your shrubs. You want to pay attention to the you know, whatever species you are needing to prune, the guidelines specific to that species. But usually late spring is good uh, before the particular species breaks dormancy and starts leafing out. And the you again, you want to cut stems of varying diameters uh, so that different size insects have nesting sites. Um, and you can accommodate different uh, body sizes. And it also mimics deer browsing, which is sort of hap haphazard. And if you're like me and don't really prune, um, you can at least take solace if the deer are browsing your, your shrubs that they are creating new pollinator nesting habitat for the season. If you cut your stems last spring, um, you can let them, you do want to let them stand uh, during this year's current spring cleanup. Uh, that the new plant growth will come up quickly and will help um, hide all the stem stubble and the, the open um, tubes of stems that you had all through last growing season could be housing um, different insect eggs, larvae, pupa, um, and overwintering adults. You want to make sure you leave that good habitat from last year um, in this year's current spring cleanup. You can, um, as spring progresses, start observing your cut stems for signs of use. So look for uh, blocked um, ends of your cut stems and it'll be blocked with pieces of natural material like little bits of leaf, mud, pebbles, um, grass, or resin. And pay attention to, you know, what species do you see that on? how high were the cut stem pieces and what seems to be getting used the most. And you can use that to inform what you do the next spring as far as your stem cutting goes. Um, you can also take stock of native plant diversity and research what species in your particular area are known to be good tuttle or stem nesting insect homes. So for example, um, in our area in, in mid-Michigan, um, elderberry in the genus Sambucus, uh, sumacs in the genus Roos, raspberries and blackberries in the genus Rubus um, are all good plants to have, known to have um, good hollow stems. Uh, if you did invasive European honeysuckle uh, treatment, you can girdle the stems but leave the shrubs standing or gather some of the twigs, those invasive honeysuckles naturally have hollow pits and make good um, bundled stem habitat. Species like bee balm in the genus Monarda, milkweeds in the genus Asclepius, roses, oh, genus Rosa, 
And cut plants and other species in the genus Silphium are examples of good plants. And then this, uh, again, this uh, giant yellow hyssop, Agastache, is, uh, has a really nice square um, hollowed out stem, providing great habitat as well. So think about how you can add more of these really critical um, stem nesting site species, add more diversity uh, to your, your native landscape plantings. I hope that helps you better understand how to save your stems this spring. Take care and have a good week.